Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift, the online cycling platform that makes training fun. Here for the opening stage, the Grande Partenza of the Giro d'Italia 2022 from Budapest to Visegrad. 195 Ks flat, nothing stage until the last 5.5 K, 4.2% finish. Is it too hard for sprinters? Is it too easy for punchers? What's it like? It's a bit steady with a 6.5% section with about... 1500 meters to go and then it levels off a bit at the end just a tricky weird giro style finish but benji and i here in budapest we thanks to zwift and we headed down to the grande partenza any highlights from the the giro village for you benji um i know you got you got in the in the bus zone you saw your hero attila volta who seemed like a consummate professional what were your highlights this morning I think a lot of the meeting the riders that we speak to of the podcast, like sometimes I talk to like a Matthias Kelmos and being able to see that guy in real life, talk to him, Barnabas Peak, that kind of riders and just meeting them and also meeting some people that follow the podcast. And I think that's the biggest highlight, seeing other people be passionate about what we do and therefore be more passionate about it ourselves. And I think this entire experience is, uh, has been fun for you. Yeah, it's been good. It's been really good. It's like there's additional stress with logistics and, you know, we because we do video, we need sort of higher internet requirements and all that sort of thing, but it's been worth it. It was a relaxed uh, Grande Partenza. It was like it wasn't Catalonia style chill, uh, but it wasn't like I think what I would imagine the Tour de France in, in Copenhagen will be like. We saw like, for example, MVDP coming back from the team presentation before the stage. You're just cruising back. There's like no one on the barriers. People are like hello, saying hello to him. And speaking of MVDP, he was the favorite for this stage. You might not have seen. He started his recovery from the back injury on Zwift back in January. And it's crazy how the top pros like him and people like myself, you can get your legs back under you, your confidence in on the bike back on Zwift. It's the cycling app that makes training fun it can help you get fitter and have more fun on the bike with real world and fantasy locations to ride in hundreds of workouts on demand training plans and a packed calendar of group rides so if you want to check out zwift you can head to zwift.com through the link down below for a free seven day trial but yeah the biggest surprise for me of the day benji was the break it goes straight out of neutral. We were standing there on Drissi Avenue where the, they did, they, the neutral zone was through the city. They got out of the city. We look on our phones. Uh, we thought their website was bugged. It was two Androni riders, no Yolo Cometa, no Bardiani, no – who's the other? Is that all the Italian Pro Conti teams or I missed one? I think that's all of them. Vinny doesn't exist anymore. So uh, those are the ones, two riders of that same team, Drone Hopper in that breakaway. I think it was Bice and Taliani. But you know when that breakaway goes, it's not going to stay up there. Like the peloton's going to uh, kind of mingle the gap open. They're going to allow them to go and they're going to make the gap large enough so that people don't jump to it. And then they're going to make sure they can control it again towards the end of the stage. And it wasn't really an effort of like one team that, held it together there were multiple teams that did it like and alpacin was in there i think anton mache tried a bit as well and then also we have ef education first and i don't know court did you have high expectations of him today i don't think i ever remember court beating like the gc group or the main sprinter group in anything recently he wins from breakaways um and this is effectively a one-day race in that there is a zero like it was perfect for the peloton seeing the two Androni guys go there. Like, easiest day ever. You know, Alperson, as you said, EF and co rotating a rider on front. Um, but yeah, I didn't. I mean, court sure, like top five, top seven, but to beat MVP, Germay just doesn't have that that real top kick. What I was surprised by was DSM. I'm looking through the results. I was like, are they going for Dainese? They rode not at the front, but they had their train or all their riders. They have Case Bowl and Danaza here, but they're mainly here for part AGC, just sitting all in a line, not in the bubble at the back of the peloton. I, for what reason, Benji? Do you think that's a hangover from Bade crashing in the Vuelta on like a misc sprint stage? And they're just that's like a safety thing that they're just going to ride the front for no reason. I don't know. I actually don't know. I don't know why they would 
choose that position like the second team in the peloton really after the riders that are pacing the breakaway back it might be a hangover like that it might just be that they just took that spot and never really went out of that spot because like i don't think that today was the hardest stage either so it wasn't necessarily the worst position to be an eater, but it wasn't the, the most optimal one for Sartin as well. But uh, it, the gap went down. It went down really fast towards the end. And I think it it started hanging about half a minute for a bit when we came into the last 15-ish kilometers. And we know that that climb is coming in the final six-ish kilometers. So the gap is going to go down to zero before we get there because the teams are going to try and have a nervous sprint of positioning towards the bottom of that climb. And we see that happen. We see Lotto on the right side with KLB when trying to get into position. Anton Maché trying to position Girmay. We see that Vanderpool and Alpacin are on the left side of the road trying to have an entire train with Alpacin. Yeah, trying to uh, bring Vanderpool to the front as much as possible. Just all the riders trying to get to the front. And we did see a few, a few crashes there. I think it was... Was it Ballerini that was included in a crash together with a Lotto rider, an Aeolo Cometa rider and someone? Jan Tratnik, I think, might have gone down for Bahrain. It was a Bahrain rider. I couldn't tell if it was Tratnik or Sutlin. Um, Tratnik, a big contender for a stage here. Sutlin, the lead out for Bauhaus. But yeah, Van Hoeker went down hard. That was, yeah, around 10 k's to go. Fortunately, I don't believe there were many crashes before that point. Uh, but Lotto did a fantastic job. They got Ewan into the base of this climb in great position. It allowed Ewan to slide back. This is what he did on Poggio. He entered Poggio in 2021 MSR on third wheel behind the big free figure of Ghana. He was behind Zelig, I think, here. And just perfect because then we know attacks are going to come. No team is strong enough to pace for 4Ks at 4%, 5% or willing to do that. And so there are going to be attacks. You don't want to be – Ewan – you don't want to be like second or third wheel at that point. There's teams here who have the punchers who aren't sprinters, like Valverde of yesteryear, maybe not modern Valverde. Almeida and probably Ulysses, really. Ulysses never beating uh, Germay or MVP or Ewan in a proper head-to-head -head sprint. So which team was going to take it up? We actually saw, with no one pacing, any else in good position, Carapaz looking sprightly. When I saw Carapaz and Ewan together on this sort of finish, I was like, oh, this is like that Giro finish with which Carapaz won back in the day. But it's Lawrence Narsen jumping early, uh, which sort of suggested that, yeah, no team really was willing to just take it off from the base because why would Intermarche? Like, why? They just want Binium. They were front, second wheel, just steady pace, and he will be in good position at the end. Yes, certainly. And there is always the possibility that at a certain point, someone in the peloton says, OK, we have a limited amount of riders. We can't take it up anymore. So a tempo dies. So I think that's why certain riders will try that attack like Lawrence and Austin here. And he didn't get too far. He got like nine ish seconds, got a bit of a gap. But yeah, that was going nowhere. And we saw someone storming from behind Lenny Kemna. Myth, the man, the legend, was on the podcast, I think, about one and a half years ago here. Since then, plus 50 watts in every race he's done so far because he was on the podcast. And we saw that in that move. He bridged towards Lawrence Nasen, who then fell through the group. And uh, yeah, at some point, the gap was uh, a good 50, even more meters. And I was like, come on, Lenny, let's do this. Let's do this. Did you have hopes? No, I didn't have hopes. I was enjoying it. and I was cheering him on, but no, I thought... Like, Intermarche had it pretty well locked mm -hmm. down. I don't know who it was. I want to credit them. But if it was Rosa, I guess, pacing on the front uh, for Germay. We saw Ewan had slid into a pocket. MVDP was in good position, uh, keeping a sort of open left shoulder. He was around Germay's back wheel pretty much the entire time. He was the man he decided to mark, uh, which was seemed pretty astute from him. And Magnus Court was up there. Carapaz was up there. We saw then UAE. Detached from Almeida, and this is what I mentioned in the preview for this stage, they did this on Agrigento stage three or two, Giro d'Italia 2020, the one Ulisi won ahead of Honoré and Sagan. They did a hard lead out. Well, it was supposed to be a hard lead out with Formolo for Ulisi in the wheel. And then Ulisi, this eventually this catches Kamner in, say, 700 meters to go range. And Ulisi lets the wheel go, um, which is sort of what they did, but in reverse in Agrigento. And Formolo attacks. That's actually closed down by. Bill Bow and maybe Carapaz. I can't remember one other rider. Or Ewan was there too. And this is where I think Ewan Benji, he spent his bickies, I think, with about 500 meters to go. And that meant he just didn't have the punch at the end, responding to that UAE move. Almeida, yeah, they didn't, they didn't go for Almeida on the stage. So 
they didn't, uh, even though I thought he was pretty handy on this sort of finish. And Bilbao looking good. It was actually Wilco Kelderman off camera. Um, he was top five in Middle Britannia and Cote de Fosso loop stage in Tour de France. He's actually quite good at these sort of finishes and the stage of Alverde won ahead of Gagan Hart and the Dauphiné last year. But MVP's positioning, Benji, and patience, like, he, we didn't see him on this climb, but we also didn't see him having to do that huge. Remember in Torino last year when he'd have to like move up with 700 meters to go, that stupid long move onto Van Aert's wheel? Like, he seems like a different rider now in these finishes. I think there was one moment on the climb where I was like, okay, Van der Poel is a bit too far, but he like fixed that without like a surge. He fixed that by gradually moving up and making sure that other people bring him towards the front again. And it feels like he took this climb on cleverly, like you mentioned. And he stuck to that wheel of Girmay because, again, in that final 500 meters, I saw him on the wheel of Girmay and I was expecting Girmay to start launching at a certain point, which he did while Kelderman was still fighting at the front. The others were starting to sprint there. Caleb Bune also tried to come past there, but Girmay went from the wheel of everybody there on the left side past everybody but Vanderpool was in the wheel end what happened then mate yeah Binium went over the lead out of court court didn't have it um he got a top five result Binium closes Ewan but safely to the barriers he left plenty of space to go forward Ewan going backwards MVP in his wheel comes over the top of Germain marked a second favorite patient all stage and wins the stage easily in the end um not a huge celebration on the line he's won back-to-back stages into multiple stages in Torino. it's his first ever year at italia stage takes the stage perfectly drawn up perfectly executed takes to malia rosa mauro veni will be very happy indeed with that result all the big guns at the end we'll get into ewan's crash in a second but to remind you the lrcp giro coverage is supported by gcn plus you can watch all 3,410 kilometers live and ad free and on demand on GCN Plus. We have live rights worldwide, excluding New Zealand. I saw on their Twitter actually Robbie McEwen's flown over Sans baggage, um, which I think has been lost. I don't know which airline it was, and has joined them in person. So Robbie McEwen, famous Australian sprinter, uh, one of Benji's favorites actually, because he, he speaks fluent uh, Flemish, he's in on the coverage. Uh, doing commentary at GCN Plus. So if you want to catch it, all LRCP listeners from the US, UK, Australia, Canada, and Germany can get 25% off an annual GCN Plus subscription by heading to gcn.eu slash LRCP. The link is in the description down below to watch the Giro on any screen, anytime, anywhere. But this Ewan Crash Benji, one of the weirdest ones I've seen this year. He's like, Binium hasn't chopped him he's gone in front of him to the barriers and he's going quicker because Ewan's like he didn't have that zip because he had to he just lost it with 500 to go and then it's like he expected Binium to go quicker he just he just rides into Binium's back wheel right like I don't there's no other way to call this yeah that's also what I saw when I watched it and it felt like he was I don't know it's impossible to see from the helicopter angle if he was staring ahead of his wheel or straight at his handlebars, whether that has an influence, for example. We don't have good visuals of the front camera because we saw him laying on the floor without actually crashing from the front angle. It's like we're trying to figure it out, and from the helicopter angle, like you mentioned, it's just him riding straight forward, faster than the person ahead of him, into the back wheel of Girmay. And it's unfortunate to see that he crashes with this and then he was on the ground for was it ah 20 seconds 25 seconds pretty long he got up again got over the line but he looked like he looked a bit yeah battered and i hope that we can get him back at proper form in the coming days because like oh i hate seeing you in crash we saw it last year at the tour for example his crash last year and that was a bit of a i don't know it was also somewhat i don't want to say his fault but it kind of very was. similar it, like, it's similar he's that was more uh, he made a calculation made the calculation to move up on the wrong on the inside of Sagan and he expected Merlier to kick and Merlier just waited half a pedal stroke through a corner and he chopped himself more than just riding into Merlier but again it's his fault for chopping almost chopping his own self and he's done the same here but this one he maybe he had his head down that's the only explanation you can't see it from the front on or the helicopter shot uh, when he went down initially, I thought, ooh, that could be collarbone. Thankfully, it didn't seem that way. He used, I mean, 
I'm using eye doctor here. He used both hands to pick up the bike and walked across the line. Um, so hopefully it's just he did hit fall on his left shoulder. The uphill speeds, that is what I do like about this stage. We've had an uphill sprint here, but it was wide roads. Most of the time, even the, the turn into this was wide roads. And not like crazy cobbles, it wasn't wet and it was an uphill sprint. New asphalt. And yeah, new asphalt. So that's, you know, if he's gone down at the speed he went down in the Tour de France stage through last year, he dings himself up worse and he had to leave the race then. And hopefully with the TT tomorrow, he can take it easy. Uh, he still has to make the time cut, of course, but there's the sprint stage on stage three uh, to Balaton Fured, which he'll, be, he'll have been targeting. This stage, I think they were hoping he could do well, was, which he was. He's probably going to come third or fourth. Um, but yeah, unfortunate crash for Ewan. But I should read out the top 10 of this stage. And there are time gaps, which I want to talk about. Van der Poel wins the stage ahead of Gurmai. Van der Poel, Malia. Binium goes into the white jersey. Bill Bow third. Incredible performance from Bill Bow. His sprint is so good at the moment. Court fourth. Keldman fifth. Carapaz sixth. Looking sprightly. Molima seventh. Ulisi eighth. UAE, I think, not a great showing. Vendrame ninth. Schielmoz at tenth. But they're on four seconds. And so Almeida, Schielmoz, Lander, Yates, Valverde has lost time as well. Port, etc. all on four seconds. So Carapaz, an, an initial little buffer. Yeah, just, just round one to Carapaz, Benji. And next to that, if we go even further in the rankings, there's riders that should not be losing this much time. Damon Artisman loses 19 seconds today. That's a lot on a stage like this. And certainly for a rider that is a backup leader for the SM, if I dare to say he must have been a backup leader until tomorrow, uh, until this morning at least. And then we look at Fortunato, who... Uh, well, loses uh, 38 seconds on a finish like this. That's also not good. So at this point, if this is the form and he doesn't really get better than that, then he might have to go for stage wins instead of like his top 10 GC goal that he mentioned at the start of the year. But nothing too crazy outside of that. Perhaps the De La Cruz, if you consider that a GC rider, I didn't really necessarily. You think that a Kemna losing 131 is a calculated thing or is it uh, because he attacked earlier? It's because Leonard actually has, uh, he's quite a smart man. So he's like, I finished my attack and got caught. Why am I going to keep pushing it threshold to the line? Uh, he could have gone slower if he wanted to. So I think hopefully by the time Etna, uh, I'd expect Kemna to be on five minutes for Etna. Or maybe even he he doesn't and someone wants to give him the jersey like Jan Palance took to jersey. Similar rider. Uh, that's sort of in play as well. But you're right, Aaron's and Benji, he could have been going into white tomorrow after that TT. If he beat Almeida in the TT, which is possible, he did a good well to TT. He's hot and cold in it, so that's disappointing for him. I don't see him taking enough time on Almeida and Binium, probably Binium, to take you know the white jersey for a few days. Sivakov lost time. Guillaume Martin somehow lost 12 seconds. Like 12 seconds, okay, it's the Giro. It's not like the Tour. It is only 12 seconds, but still, like this is an indication of just I, I don't know how you lose in 12 seconds coming like where he is 43rd when there's just it, it shouldn't be hard to be pedal alongside even so in a big group like this on an easy stage and what can we say about the legend himself Jan Hirt he was great at the start of February he uh collapsed in one stage in the UAE tour not physically but like when it comes to the time he lost and today he loses time again what happened with Jan Hirt well, in UAE, obviously, Jabal Hafiz, something, something happened there. I don't know if he got food poisoning or, or what happened. Like, Jabal Jace is flying, so I don't know. But today, he's here for, I think him and Tarame are here for stages. Tarame, for example, was riding the front today on the flat for Girmay. Um, great love to see it into Marche. He seemed to have really good morale and uh, camaraderie from the outside. They just extended Binium. And yeah, I think here and Tarame are just here for stages. Pozza Vivo will probably try backdoor top 10 on GC. I don't know where he finished. Um, he finished in the, yeah, he finished on four seconds. So really nothing, nothing stage on GC, a bit of a, a snoozer, but you know, if you, it was, it was nice to tune in at the base of the climber with 10 Ks to go on the run in. And there's nothing really too much we've learned other than Valverde, like Valverde in particular, 26th on a stage. He used to be, would have been like a top three favorite for just really surprising. It's almost like Peo Bilbao is the new Valverde in terms of punch. So any last thoughts, Benji on, on this stage? One final thing, the, cost, the constants of life are still the same. Death, taxes, and also the fact that Mareshko is in the last 10 riders when it comes to a parkour that has at least one bridge or hill towards the finish line. Yeah, I actually saw him today. I mean, he, he hasn't, he's not that big a guy. Like, it's surprising. Like, you know, Ewan's 
he's, he's a bit bigger than Ewan, but he's not like a huge, like, kittle size guy either. But anyway, Malia Rosa to MVP, great for the race. We're happy about that too, although Binium equally would have been fantastic to see as well. Tomorrow's TT, which was going to be the first stage back in 2020, is from starts from the same place that this stage neutral zone started at Hero Square in Budapest and then winds its way through the city. It can't go over the chain bridge because it's closed down. There's a lot of things which it seems like in the city wouldn't have been under construction or renovation had this happened back in 2020, but they're kind of under construction now, including up where this finishes. They wind their way out to go over the Margaret Bridge, which is before Margaret Island, pancake flat through the city. I hope they don't do too many tram line crossings. It doesn't look like it should be raining too heavily. And then they do an irregular climb, which we wrecked yesterday. You can see that on LRCP Twitter up to um, Budapest Castle, just above. Uh, Fisherman's Bastion, beautiful spot up there. There'll be some awesome photos. The climb, though, Benji, we looked at it, and um, my eye, you know, in real life, everything looks steeper compared to the pros. But there's two, like, there's a 14% pinch cobble, or just before some cobbles or pave, rather, cobble's a bit strong, and then it winds up to like 4% false flat. It's 1300 meters, 4% average. I think it's something for a punchy MVP. Ooh, I like your pick, and uh, you know I like your pick because I've been telling you that I also like that pick for two days now. I will say that pave is just a French word for cobble, so <laughs> it doesn't really differ the category of cobble difficulty. But uh, I will say that there were some cobbles missing, and there was like a few cobbles that were like sticking out three to four centimeters. So that could actually come into play, definitely with TT bikes, because I'd argue that the parkour might not be hard enough to uh, do a, do a bike change just before the final climb or start on a road bike and so forth so time trial bike seems to be the more likely candidate in my eyes at least i um i think there's other candidates that can also do decent like tobias foss is someone i would like to do decent or would see doing decent on a parkour like this i think of adensman but after today i'm not actually that sure about it riders like that and um i'm probably missing a few that i thought of a few days ago what do you expect of a dumoulin here because on paper, this time trial would fit him to the bone a few years ago, but I'm so unconfident in him right now. I really have no idea. I don't know what to expect. He could win it. Um, I think the final TT suits him more in Verona, which is uh, has like a 4K 4% climb, which he can probably do in position, TT position. This is a bit punchier. I think it really suits the likes of MVDP, and he'll be extra motivated wearing the Malia Rosa. We saw in the Tour de France last year against all odds in the yellow jersey. He kept that yellow jersey in a longer TT. Um, but, yeah, I think Almeida should be the best of the GC contenders, uh, punchy and flat. And that the, this, the GC contenders here do not have TTs to ride home about. So, yeah, I think he should be the best. But I think MVP keeps the Malia. Whether he wins or not, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I firmly agree with that. I think that Almeida will be that GC rider that is able to use these time trials to gain a bit of an advantage on the likes of a Carapaz, who was good today, and perhaps he can take back those four seconds or even more on tomorrow's time trial. On paper, Almeida should take more than four seconds on Carapaz on a time trial like that, I'd say. But you never know. Carapaz might uh, might have changed his TT position because I swear I oh, saw yeah, two pictures is. in the... Was it oh, a few weeks ago? I saw two pictures where one of them was like uh, a, a position of last year and this year's position was just more arrow obviously my eyes are not the most arrow identifying eyes in the peloton but i will say that it looked more arrow to me yeah it definitely looked different and head down position i think he'll do a good tt and you know it's not that long like we shouldn't be seeing huge time gaps here lando will probably lose like 25 30 seconds and be like what what's going on there Ivan sosa as well not a great tt i think kelderman will do a really good tt he looks good uh, in good shape on this finish, although it suited him. And yeah, we're going in the Umbo Visma in the van tomorrow behind one of their guys doing a TT. That should be good. Make sure you follow LRCB Twitter. We might have some snippets on there. We don't know which rider yet. I hope it's not Dumoulin or Foss, like the high pressure ones. And um, and yeah, we'll see what it's like being in the in the car behind a TT. Maybe I hope we're not cursed. We like they have like two punctures on the pave, and that'll definitely be our fault for being like that's what whenever we i pick a favorite they get sick um so yeah but that'll be fun looking forward to it um and yeah any big dark horses tomorrow for the tt benji because it is like there are there aren't like the gunners and wild van arts and kungs here it's a soft 
at the top GTT field. And I said MVDP, but could a douse or someone pull it off? I don't think so. I think the climb we actually wrecked, we reconned, was a bit too hard for a douser to be able to pull this off. And he had his Tireno time trial, which was great, but it's not like he consistently had the great time trials on that level recently. So I don't see that. Afini is one of the riders that I see doing well until the climb starts. And then I don't know how far he can get because Afini got over the Bergs in the Classics quite well. So if he can play that out on this time trial, then I see him getting a top five perhaps. If it's more, even better for him. But uh, I hope we're not in the car of Affini, for example. I, w- I would like to be in the car of Pascal Enko, and a rider that is likely not going to be hunting for the time trial. But then again, is it really an experience very realistic if it's a rider like Enko? I mean, yeah, sure. They all look fast to me. So I'd be like, <laughs> well, 47 kilometers now versus 50, both look pretty fast to me. I wonder if Binium keeps the white jersey. I don't think. Scale Molder. I butcher that. Yeah, I think him or him or Almeida will nick it off, uh, Binium. So that's one to watch as well. The white jersey battle. Aaronsman's a little bit out of that for after the TT tomorrow. But a fun start in Budapest. Not huge GC gaps, but some early little jabs. No haymakers, just little jabs. Carapaz looking sprightly. I'm feeling pretty confident in my pick of him, and uh, hopefully I can get the Wilco Kelderman unofficial fan club T-shirt into the Bora Hansgrohe team bus tomorrow i'll try and organize that with with kemner and surprise kelderman it might give him some extra watts before that tt but we hope you enjoyed this podcast thanks as always to zwift who their supports enabled us to come over to budapest and enjoy this experience and go to our first grand tour go to zwift.com for a free seven-day trial as well as if you want to watch the zero d'italia gcn plus has it live and on demand in all territories except uh new zealand Link down below for 25% off in certain territories. And that's all from us. We're going to go get dinner and uh, we'll keep you updated on Twitter before the recap tomorrow. Ciao.